No, Kevin, I'm sure. I'm sure the Mersey beats were absolutely delightful. <laughs> yes. The following podcast contains... Your use of language has altered since our arrival. It is currently laced with, shall I say, more colorful metaphors. Double dumbass on you, and so forth. You mean the profanity? Yes. That's simply the way they talk here. Nobody pays any attention to you unless you swear every other word. Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you hired your lead singer because his dad had a sound system and didn't think that was going to cause problems later, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host, Dave Bledsoe, and this is episode number 373. David and Eddie had had it already by the summer of 85, where we talk about the sad but inevitable breakup of David Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen. Stay tuned. The What the Hell You Thinking podcast is brought to you by Diamond Dave School of Dance. Are you a rhythmically challenged individual whose soul yearns to explore the world through interpretive dance? Then we're not for you. But if you're the front man of a hard rock band just looking to shake your thing for all the hot young women in the audience while the lead guitarist handles all the musical shit, then you need Diamond Dave's School of Dance. We will teach you how to strut, how to swing, and how to do the splits on stage with and without the microphone stand. Diamond Dave's will provide you with a drip jeans, scarf, skin-tight t-shirts that are already pre-torn for easy tearing and tossing into the screaming audience, and we offer as many as three dance moves that you can use to make you the rock god you were always meant to be. Diamond Dave's School of Dance, because music is hard, but that doesn't matter if you seem fuckable. Rock and roll has had its fair share of flamboyant mouthpieces. James Brown, Little Richard, Mick Jagger, just to name a few. Well, now the undisputed king of the roost is Van Halen lead singer David Lee Roth. Gene Wolfe talked and spent a lot of time listening to The Mouth That Roars. Although Van Halen's had six straight platinum albums since their debut in 1978, Jump is the group's first number one single. But it's not something lead singer David Lee Roth is going to let go to his head. People say to me, Dave, 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 now you made number one. Now you're getting up there at the top. How does it feel? How does it feel? And I've thought about it a million different ways. Somebody, a young lady the other night said to me, Dave, I know you're really making it big now. She said, you know, but you can't buy love. And I said to myself, you know, you're absolutely correct but I can darn sure pull my yacht right up next to it and walk over. So like I said, my, my dad was in the Air Force when I was a kid, and in 1983, his job at the time was to command a small group of people who got basically delivered inter-office mail around the base. This was in the days before Slack, and hell, it was in the days before email. Doesn't that feel like a million years ago? If you wanted to send a memo to another building, a young person literally had to drive it over there and put it in a mailbox. Now, many of those young people who delivered those letters were single, and so that meant they lived in the dorms, though I still think they were calling them barracks back then. Sometimes young people being young people, they, they liked to party and play loud music well into the wee hours of the morning. That meant my dad would sometimes get called out in the middle of the night to come down to the dorms and tell his people to, uh, you know, turn that shit down. When this happened, my dad would get really mad because it was usually like midnight or something, and he was he he was always asleep by like 10 p.m. Great. What does this have to do with anything? I am getting there, people. Settle down. So one night. My dad got so mad at those people that he took the music they were playing so loud, which was a thing he wasn't actually allowed to do. When I was in the Air Force, I, I was a cop, and there's actually a procedure for that, and he didn't do any of it. But, you know, he, he did it anyway, and they were just some cassette tapes that people had recorded music on, not the actual album, just, just the copy of it, you know, on a blank cassette. And so the next morning, he's debating what to do with these contraband tapes. He's thinking, maybe I'll just throw him in the trash, but that's that's when he remembered that he had a chubby, nerdy, barely 13-year-old son that liked to record silly songs off the radio from Dr. Demento. Hello there, this is Dr. Demento. We're on the radio here. And so he, he just gives those tapes to that chubby, nerdy kid, thinking that that's exactly what he was going to do with them. Mr. that 
chubby, nerdy kid took to look at those names written on the cassettes, saying something about some dude named Van Halen, and he thought he would check it out before he recorded Fish Heads over it. And he put the cassette of something called Diver Down into his player and pushed play, and this is what came out. And that was all she wrote for any hope of peace and quiet in my parents' homes for about the next, well, pretty much a decade or so when you factor in my little sister who discovered rock and roll shortly after I did. It was probably a good thing for those kids that threw that loud party in the dorms that it took a little while for my new appreciation of loud rock music to be noticed by my dad. Those dudes probably would have caught a dishonorable discharge for something like disturbing the tranquility of a superior officer's household or I, I, at best contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Why do I bring all this up? Well, that's because it's it's about this week's topic. About damn time. Have y'all not noticed the show has a format with some sort of folksy anecdote about my childhood that's relevant to the topic? Never mind. Now, I loved Van Halen from the start, but Van Halen was never my favorite band. I was into heavy metal, which Van Halen was not. It was hard rock, but it wasn't heavy metal. Bands like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest of the Scorpions, they were heavy metal, and those were the bands I banged my head to and eventually developed chronic neck pain from doing so. But that being said, I was a huge, 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 huge fan of David Lee Roth. Not so much for the music, but for the attitude that personified Diamond Dave. Indeed, my nickname in junior and senior year of high school was Diamond Dave. You were mocking you. No, no. I mean, just because I couldn't sing or dance or play guitar very well and <laughs> look nothing at all like David Lee Roth doesn't mean they were mocking me. Holy shit, they were mocking me. You know, I'm Facebook friends with the guy who gave me that nickname. I'm, I'm going to have words with him. Trust me. Anyway, not long after I found them, Van Halen, who had always sold well, finally broke, in, bi broke big on the charts with a little album named 1984. <laughs> the first single was re released in 1983. A little song that they called Jump, Jumped. <laughs> See, there's a pun. There's a pun right there. It, it, it went all the way to the number one on the charts real, real fucking quick. singles that were released off of 1984 all hit the top 20, Panama, I'll Wait, and Hot for Teacher. The band's videos were in heavy rotation on MTV. God, MTV loved Van Halen, and David Leveroff loved being on MTV. Diamond Dave was made for MTV, so much that he pretty much became the face of the band on MTV, which meant that he was the face of the band for the whole entire fucking world. And that did not set well with Eddie Van Halen, the founder and legit musical genius and guitarist of the band. Indeed, it didn't set well with anyone in the band. This fucking guy. This is the story of what happened before and after 1984, the biggest year in Van Halen. So let's start with the beginning. Quoting from Eddie's Wikipedia page, quote, Edvard Ludovic Van Halen and his brother Alexander Otto Van Halen were born in Amsterdam July 26, 1955, the son of Jan Van Halen and Eugenia Van Halen. His father was a Dutch jazz pianist, clarinetist, and saxophonist, while his mother was an Indo-Eurasian woman from Rangkasbitung on the island of Java in the Dutch East Indies. The family eventually settled in Nijmegen in the Netherlands and after experiencing mistreatment for their mixed race relationship in the 1950s, the parents moved to the United States in 1962. Are, are you sure about that? Yeah, uh, because the United States was so embracing of mixed race couples in 1962. 
Though, to be fair, Eddie and his brother Alex looked white enough that even though they were still officially categorized as mixed race, they got on all right. I do love America. Eddie was, to put it simply, a musical prodigy. Oh, he was fond of telling people that, you know, he, uh... I never learned to read music. He could never learn to read music. He could watch and listen to a piece of music and reproduce it flawlessly on the piano, though he preferred to improvise on what he had just learned rather than play it as it was, as it was written. His parents wanted Eddie and Alex to be classical pianists, but it was the 60s and both grabs that gravitated toward rock and roll, particularly the British invasion bands like, well, you know, what other band would they be into besides the Mersey Beats? I think of you every I meant the Beatles. The two decided that they would form their own band. Originally, Eddie was going to play drums, that then he heard Alex flawlessly reproducing drum rips and solos and decided, yeah, he's better than I am on the drums, so I'll just go ahead and take up guitar. Yeah, Eddie Van Halen only became a guitarist because Alex Van Halen was a better drummer than he was. That's how bad Eddie was at the drums, because Alex, great drummer, but no one looks at him as one of the greatest rock drummers of all time. He, he's no Neil Peart. Quick pointless aside, one of the names of the bands that Eddie and Alex formed you, was in the early days was Genesis. But then they decided they better leave that name behind because some other little band in England was already using it. Never heard of them. Around the same time as Eddie and Alex were getting their bands together, a young Indianan, by way of Pasadena, graduated high school and enrolled in Pasadena City, City College and was getting ready to rock and roll because that's all Dave really wanted to do was be in rock and roll. In 1972, Diamond Dave was fronting a band called the Red Ball Jet. Was that like a drug thing? According to Roth, no, it was about this red food dye that was used in his favorite candy balls, but come on. It was 1972 in Southern California, so, you know, you can draw your own conclusions. It's definitely drugs, all right? Red Ball Jet wasn't exactly burning up the local music scene from what I could find, and admittedly, that wasn't much. The band had some good raw talent, but never really did come together and never took off. What Red Ball Jet did have was their very own PA system, or rather, the lead singer's dad had a PA system, and this other band that was going by the name of Mammoth at the time, they would rent that PA system from Red Ball Jet for 10 bucks a night. Now, the guitarist and drummer of Mammoth, who just happened to be brothers with the same last name, Van Halen, were in the market for a new lead singer because Ed was pulling double duty guitar and singing. Have you ever heard Eddie Van Halen sing? Of course you have. He did harmonizing vocals throughout the band's history, but Ed was a guitarist, not a lead singer. And when David Lee Roth heard that this band Mammoth that was renting his dad's PA was in the market for a singer, he auditioned. And I think we all know how that went. They said no. Dave was not one to take no for an answer and came back and auditioned a second time. And do you know what they said then? And they still said no. But that third audition, well, it didn't so much pay off as, as wore everybody down. According to Eddie in a 1978 interview with Guitar Magazine, quote, we used to rent his PA and we said, fuck it, it's cheaper if we just get him in the band. And so we got Dave in the band. That's, that's confidence inspiring. A short time later, they were forced to change their name yet again because a band up in San Francisco was using the name Mammoth. Oh, and around the same time, they, they got a new bassist. This, this dude by the name of Michael Anthony was like the least well-known person in the group. And, you know, if I weren't already running long for this episode, I might spend some time talking about Michael Anthony, but... Look, no one ever talks about the bass player. I mean, it's it's rock and roll law. Now, I mentioned a whole bunch of names and name changes. And look, changing names of bands when they're coming up is just part of the entire thing. So how did they arrive at the name Van Halen? Well, I'll let societyofrock.com explain that for me. Quote, it was in 1973 when they got David Lee Roth on board. In the middle of that year, they were forced to change their name after San Fernando Group. I said San Francisco earlier. Just ignore that. With the same name, sent them a cease and desist letter. They also replaced their bassist with Michael Anthony. 
Alex and Eddie wanted to give a nod to Black Sabbath, so they considered using Rat Salad as their band name, but it was Roth who pushed for Van Halen instead. Diamond Dave believed it was more than just a name. It should hold power and give them their identity as a group, unquote. Now, we have the complete foursome that was Van Halen. According to the band's Wikipedia page, quote, they continued to play Pasadena, San Bernardino, San Bernardino, and Venice at clubs, festivals, and backyard parties in city parks like Hamilton, drawing up to 2,000 people. Traffic jams and noise complaints to the local police often ensued as far away as San Pedro. Van Halen subsequently played clubs in Los Angeles and West Hollywood to growing audiences, increasing their popularity entirely through self-promotion, passing out flyers at local high schools. This soon built them an auspicious, loyal area following. In 1974, the band got a major break when it was hired to play regularly at the Sunset Strip Club. The owner previously claimed Van Halen was too loud. However, Sunset Strip Club new managers took over the club's hiring and booked them through 1976. By the spring of 1975, they were also in regular Tuesday night, Tuesday night band at Myron's Ballroom. They had succeeded in becoming a staple of the Los Angeles music scene during the mid-1970s, playing at well-known clubs like Whiskey A Go-Go on the Sunset Strip, unquote. It was none other than marketing legend and occasional makeup-wearing musician Gene Simmons of Kiss. You, you know Gene, he was the one with the, uh... With the devil's tongue. <laughs> that helped Van Halen produce their first demo tape in hope of getting a record contract. They recorded 29 songs at Simmons' studio, almost all of them originals, but there were some covers in there, and those songs would pretty much be their first three albums when they got their contract. But that contract didn't come easy as Kiss's management took a listen and determined the group had, quote, no chance of making it, unquote. Presumably because Van Halen did not have a plan to get on lunchboxes or so much as a concept for their own pinball machines. That's because you have no vision. It would take legendary record producer Ted Templeman, who was behind such bands as the Doobie Brothers and that other famous Van band, Van Morrison, who was looking for a guitar legend act to produce. And when he heard Ed, he knew he'd found it. Debbelman managed to get Van Halen a pretty shitty record deal with Warner Brothers, but everyone got shitty record deals in those days. And they released their first album, titled simply enough, Van Halen 1. Nothing fancy. Simple, simple. That album went to went on to chart at number 19 on the Billboard album chart. And that was a phenomenal debut for a band in those days and one of the most successful first albums of all time to this very day. Again, from Wikipedia, quote, it was highly regarded as both a heavy metal and hard rock album. The album included songs now regarded as Van Halen classes like Running With The Devil and the guitar solo Eruption, which showcased Eddie's use of a technique known as finger tapping. The band toured nine months more opening for Black Sabbath and establishing a reputation for their performances. The band's chemistry was based on Eddie Van Halen's guitar technique and David Lee Ross' charisma. The band returned to a studio for two weeks, two weeks in late 1978 to record Van Halen 2, a 1979 LP similar in style to their debut. This record yielded the band's first hit single, Dance in the Night Away, which peaked at number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100. Over the next four years, the band toured nonstop, never taking more than two weeks to record an album. Their Women and Children first album was released in 1980 and further cemented Van Halen's platinum selling status to Warner Brothers. It yielded two hit singles and The Cradle Will Rock and Everybody Wants Some. And for the first time, an amplified Wurlitzer electric piano was used to complement Ed's guitar, unquote. That's, that's some foreboding right there. Van Halen was phenomenally successful as a band. Eddie Van Halen, a genuine fucking musical genius and his guitar style and virtuosity was readily apparent. Every young axe slinger in America wanted to play like Ed and his influence would dominate hard rock and heavy metal for decades. And Dave, Dave was, Dave was Dave. Flamboyant, charismatic, sexy as hell, his lion mane of hair, dancer's body, and dynamic energy just screamed. Do you want to fuck him? And yes, everyone in the audience, the answer was yes. Even in the very straightest of straight dudes, this was the kind of this was the early 80s, they were very straight, secretly in their heart of hearts, kind of just wanted to fuck David Lee Roth. I, I know I did. And the music hit America at just the right time. Disco was dead and all the red-blooded young dudes of the United States were seeking to uh, find a way to 
wave away that lingering miasma of dance music, which they consider to be, uh... Seems kind of gay. And Van Halen hit it just the right time to capitalize on that feeling. For more on this, see episode number 361, The Night They Drove Old Disco Down. That's, uh, that's a plug. Yeah, always be plugging. That's the Seltzer King motto. But at the same time, there were tensions behind the scenes. Some might even say there was drama. You gonna play it? No, I think I've played the dramatic gopher sting enough for a while. It's best to let it rest and bring it back around later when you're not expecting it. 1981's Fair Warning was, well, it was a... It was fair warning. Really, Dave? Of things ahead, Ed was looking to move, move into what he described as darker, more musically challenging songs, while Dave and Templeman both felt that fixing something that was clearly not broken and actually was printing them money like nobody's fucking business probably wasn't the best idea. But when Eddie Van Halen, your genuine fucking musical genius, wanted to go in a direction, you kind of followed his lead. And it got so bad during the recording sessions that Templeman, the dude in charge of the whole making the whole album, stormed out of the studio so pissed off. Fair warning, which contains great fucking songs. Unchained, personal favorite of mine. It's a standout on the album. In fact, it was this bit right here off Fair Warning that was also on the tapes my dad gave me that really made me fall in love with Diamond Dave. Fair Warning never really uh, it never really hit with fans the way the first the the other albums had in fact it took about a quarter million dollars of payola to DJs to push the record into its platinum status if you don't know what payola is you can either google it or I'll get around to doing a show about payola one of these days soon now after Fair Warning the band had planned to go on hiatus they'd been on tour and in the studio years in a row Warner Brothers wanted a new album and they dangled money in front of them in a form of a better record contract so the band reluctantly went back into the studio for diver down you know sorry i know this is just really becoming well it's like a behind the music and it's only going to get worse from here on out diver down went with diamond dave's preference for pop recovers and upbeat songs and did much better than fair warning and at the same time the band was booked by apple co-founder steve wozniak for one $1.5 $1.5 million to play the US Festival in 1983, making the Guinness Books of World Records for the highest paid gig in history. And oh God, that gig was a shit show because the money was making things worse because everybody was fucked up on cocaine, booze, and groupie pussy. That sounds awesome. Eddie was drunk almost all the time and Dave was doing coke. Well, Dave was doing coke like a rock star in the 1980s. Alex was so horned out, he was trying to fuck everything that moved, including the band's manager's wife and Michael Anthony. It got so bad with Michael Anthony that for some reason, Ed was talking to other utterly generic and totally replaceable bass players in other bands. Poor Michael. You know, as a bass player, is already getting the dregs of the drugs and the dregs of the pussy. It don't seem fair to me that he got treated like this, but again, I don't make these rules about bass players. It's the iron law of rock and roll. Ed was also busy at the time building his own home studio where he could record Van Halen albums without interference of people like, you know, Ted Tippleman, the producer, and Diamond Dave. And Diamond Dave was also thinking to himself, maybe this shit is going to go bad. So he was looking for an escape plan himself. Alex was looking to get laid. Michael was looking to find something on the empties table that might still have some booze in it. And despite all of this, Van Halen went back into the studio in 1983 and recorded what would be their best selling and most iconic album of the Diamond Dave era, the aforementioned 1984. 1984 peaked at number two on the album chart and would have been number one by a mile, except there was this other little album on the charts at the time by a nice young fellow by the name of Michael Jackson, who was charming the hearts and charts of America like they were the 12-year-old boys in Mike's bedroom and Mike just came in with a cup of Jesus juice. It was never proven in a court of law. 
Well, of course, I'm just saying that without, you know, without Thriller on the charts, 1984 would have gone to number one like a bullet. That's all I... I would never insinuate that Jackson was anything other than a platonic play partner for those preteen boys he liked to snuggle with at night. If you're looking for a touch of irony, Beat It, which was one of the best-selling singles off Thriller, which kept 1984 from becoming number one, actually featured Ed with a guitar solo, something that Dave, in later years, was never, ever quite able to not take a shot at him over. Oh, my God. 1984 was the year for Van Halen. They were everywhere. They were MTV's darlings. Good God, MTV's Van Halen's Lost Weekend damn near killed the guy that won it with all the drug fuel fuckery that went on. God, that would probably make a good Patreon exclusive if I could just find the time to write and produce it. Did I, did I write in for Van Halen's Lost Weekend contest? No, I mean, I totally would have, but I was 14 and my mom would have fucking killed me. By the end of 1984, everyone was done with everyone. Even Alex and Ed were pissed at each other and Dave, Dave was starting a solo career. Now, look, I know it's probably pretty obvious to you pod friends that I have a definite bias in how I view the breakup. And yeah, you're correct in that. I, I fully recognize that Eddie Van Halen was a musical genius, but I also actually fully acknowledge that Eddie Van Halen was pretty much a, uh, He's a total and complete asshole. I mean, even Ed would admit it in later years. Grunge.com put it this way, quote, One thing that Eddie excels at is taking stabs at people after they've left the band. Once Roth departed, the barbs flew. When he discovered Roth was working on a movie prior to his Van Halen departure, Eddie publicly said that Dave left to be a movie star and that he even boldly asked if Eddie would write a score for him. Years later, after Sammy Hagar came and went, Oh, pod friends, hang on. That's next week. Eddie talked smack about his work ethic and described his songwriting as cheesy. Eddie even went on to attack bassist and fan favorite Michael Anthony in 2015, saying that he had to teach him every note he ever played. So being in a band with Eddie Van Halen may not have always been rainbows and sunshine, unquote. That being said, I also have to admit that David Lee Roth was a... Uh, Raving egomaniac. Rolling Stone said in, 19, in a 1986 story, quote, Roth's cocky stage act was no pose either. The band members complained it was like he was on stage at all time, grumbles Michael Anthony. Oh, Michael, you're a bass player. Know your place. He had come to rehearsal and we'd have to stay. Okay, you could take the mask off. You were the boys in the band. I would dread having to do a photo session with a guy because I worried about how Roth would think I looked when I got there. I know Edward and Alex felt the same way because Roth saying, you got to dress this way and go buy some clothes. Why are you wearing that? Unquote. That's just because Dave wanted you guys to be hip and cool, Mike. Jesus, you're a bass player. Again, know your place. But of the two, it was Ed that wanted Dave gone more. As 1984 came out, the war between Ed and Dave was getting harder and harder to hide. Ed won the battle to be, to be musically diverse, resulting in the synth-heavy songs of 1984, which was a hard rock heresy at the time. I mean, it raised a lot of eyebrows amongst purest headbangers, leading to some dark muttering around my school lunch table that Eddie was selling out with this synthesizer shit. And Ed had also sacked Templeman as the band producer and brought on someone that would take his side in disagreements. As quoted in the Washington Post, quote, When I first played Jump for the band, nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. Dave said that I was a guitar hero and I shouldn't be playing keyboards, Eddie told Guitar World. My response was, if I wanted to play tuba or Bavarian cheese whistle, I would do it, unquote. So Dave tried to maneuver the video director into focusing on him in the 1984's Jump and largely failed... And when that all fell apart, it was pretty much that is when Dave decided he was done. Loudersound.com takes it from here. Quote, Eddie Van Halen was the most famous guitar player in the world. Yet even he wasn't the biggest star in his own band. That was Diamond Dave, a fast-talking, high-kicking showman with a huge ego and seemingly endless supply of comic one-liners. It was Ross' outsized personality that made them super famous. To fans and media alike, the band would be sunk without David Lee Roth. There had always been conflict within Van, within Van Halen, and it reached critical mass months before Roth left. The band had disintegrated into a spiteful bunch of bleary-eyed, argumentative, procrastinated individuals, he later explained. 
His exit had been carefully planned. The singer had been rehearsing in secret with a new band closely modeled on Van Halen, right down to virtuo guitarist Steve Vai. Roth had already tested the water earlier for the, at the start of 1985 with Crazy from the Heat, a four-track cover EP which reached number 15 on the Billboard charts. In the race between Van Halen and their newly departed singer, the smart money at the time was on Diamond Dave, unquote. So, Dave left the band, and it was widely assumed he would go on to a smash solo career, and Van Halen would more or less wither away. Everyone knew that Eddie would wind up somewhere as a lead guitarist, but Van Halen as an act was done. Ed actually invited Patti Smythe of the band Scandal to replace Dave, but she declined. Now, that's an interesting counterfactual thought experiment, if Patti Smythe had actually joined Van Halen would have been a different band. It wouldn't have been Van Halen, but it would have been interesting. Also, apparently, Daryl Hall. Poor John Oates left behind again. Daryl was offered the gig as lead singer for Van Halen, but he too turned it down. I'm pretty sure that Daryl's ego and Ed's ego would have gone super critical super quickly, although I would like to have seen a Blue White Soul version of Van Halen. And when rumors broke that the band was thinking about bringing Sammy Hagar, of all people, in to do vocals for for them, ah, that was just ludicrous. Sammy Hagar, this guy wasn't a has-been so much as an almost was. Of course, we all know that Sammy was a great choice to replace David Lee Roth, and the band had a really different energy, and Sam could belt out the earlier hits credibly, but it was the new music that kept Van Hagar which it was commonly called behind Eddie's back because if you did that to his face, he would get really fucking pissed. But it was that new music that they wrote and record with Sammy that kept the band relevant way into the 90s. The band also went on to score more hit singles, though not ever anything quite like 1984 singles. And 5150 and An Unlawful Carnal Knowledge both hit number one on the Billboard album charts as did two rather more forgettable albums of the Van Hagar. They also charted, but no one can even remember the name, not even me. And of course, this era too, the Van Hagar era, well, what can I say about that? Tell you what, I won't say anything because we're going to talk about that next week. Hint, hint. David Lee Roth went on to a long career as a radio DJ in New York City. Yeah, his, uh, his solo career never really went anywhere. The EP Crazy from the Heat peaked at number 12 on California Girls. The, the cover he did on Crazy from the Hit p- hit number three on the Hot 100. His first full album, Eat Em and Smiles, it, it hit number four on the charts. And the single, Yankee Rose, peaked at number 10 on the Hot 100. Solid, solid fucking song, but not a stunning song. Dave's planned movie career never materialized because, well, grunge took over the rock music scene and Dave slowly slipped from relevance. Though, well, to be honest with you, It was never far from my heart. I mean, I still do a fucking fantastic cover of Dave's Just a Gigolo, and though I've been told that as I grow older, my dance moves to the song tend to make people slightly nauseous, I'm going to do them anyway, because never get old, people. When the band was was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1996, Dave reunited with Van Halen for a very short time and an even more bitter breakup. He's released several more albums of little note and little success, and Dave is officially retired in 2021, not too long, not too much later after Ed died. His hair's gone. He kind of looks like a shrunken version of himself, but he's still fucking Diamond Dave when you hear him speak. You know, he's a licensed EMT in New York, and yeah, he's currently retired and doing what retired rock stars do, apparently drawing and painting. But uh, in my heart, Diamond Dave is still swinging over the stage in skin-tight leather pants to a screaming crowd of women that want to fuck both of us while I am on stage shredding my axe in a blistering solo. No, Dave, no. Fuck that, kids. Never give up on your dreams, even if you are too old to have them. I'm still going to learn how to fucking play Eddie Van Halen solos on my guitar. (laughs) That is it for our show this week. This is one of those shows that I had in the hopper as an emergency reserve topic because I didn't think with enough meat on the bone to support a full show. But then a week or so ago, while I'm riffing through my topic list, and there it was, and all of a sudden, Billy Joel's scenes from an Italian restaurant popped into my head, and I knew I had the title for the episode, 
And once you got the title, everything else just comes easy. The breakup of Van Halen was a real moment in my childhood because I could not imagine Van Halen being Van Halen without Diamond Dave. And oh, oh yeah, I asked Todd, the guy who, who gave me the Diamond Dave nickname when I was in high school, if he was mocking me. And he said, no, man, no. He could see that there was a wild man inside of me just waiting to get away from my parents so it could come out. And you know what? Todd was not wrong. I mean, I'm not David Lee Roth. because I don't have the ass for it. But uh, if you've ever seen me sing Just a Gigolo on stage at a karaoke club, you too will see what Todd saw. Speaking of things you never want to happen, rate and review this show so people will find it and never, ever want to have something like listen to the show happen again. If you think our low rent behind the musics are worth like a dollar, kick us to us at patreon.com slash what the hell podcast. And you must do all the things Jeremy tells you to do in the closing, because if not, he will break up the band and start his own solo career, which technically I guess he already has since he actually runs the network. And so for me, Diamond Dave, Hamala Babala, Hamala Babala, Hamala Babala, Zebele Bop, Bledsoe, and producer, nobody cares for me because I'm a man trapped in hell. Gavin and all the fictional Michael Anthony's on this show, we want to say, David and Eddie had had it already by the summer of 85. From the height of the love to the end of the shows for the rest of their lives, they couldn't go back to the greasers. Damn it. I didn't plan to do that. That just happened. We'll see you all next week. What the Hell Were You Thinking stars Dave Bledsoe and features Gavin St. James and several fictional minions. The show is produced by Kimberly Steele and a part of the Seltzer Kings Podcast Network. You can find more information on the show on their website, whatthehellpodcast.com, or on Twitter at the hell underscore podcast, or on Facebook as What The Hell Podcast. Thanks for listening. I have no ending for this, so I take a small bow. Sammy Hagar, greatest lead singer in Van Halen history.